Imagine you are kidnapped by a tall, angry man, and he forces you into his basement. He gives you a beaker and says, I will release you only when you can tell me what monoprotic weak acid I poured in here. And he locks the door. You think, how could I possibly do that? He could have poured any acid in there. And I don't even know how dilute or concentrated it is. Your release seems hopeless. But then you remember something. You know some chemistry. First, you take note that you have 50 milliliters of this unknown acid. Then, you rummage around your confines to see what you can find, and you come up with an electronic pH meter. Now, you can think of pH as the power of hydrogen, or the power or concentration of hydrogen ions in the water-based solution you have. The more hydrogen ions you have, the more acidic it is. Now, as a metric for this, you use the number of moles of hydrogen ions per liter of the whole solution, or the molarity of the hydrogen ions. And because the molarity of the hydrogen can vary so much between different acids and bases, we use the negative logarithm of that scale. So, if the molarity of the hydrogen is 10 to the negative 5, the pH is 5. You measure the pH of this unknown acid to be 2.4. So the molarity of the hydrogen is 10 to the negative 2.4, or about 3.98 times 10 to the negative 3. And just as a quick side note, whenever I say hydrogen or hydrogen ions when referencing acids or bases, I'm really talking about hydronium, a hydrogen ion attached to a nearby water molecule, H3O+. Now, for the rest of the video, I'm going to refer to this hydronium as hydrogen, because that's convention, but just know that these hydrogens are actually hydroniums. Now that you have the pH, the next thing you need to find is the molarity of the acid itself. But you begin to question yourself. Isn't that just the same thing? The pH is the molarity of the hydrogen ions? But then, you remember something. I will release you only when you can tell me what monoprotic weak acid I poured in here. A weak acid, that's it. A weak acid is an acid that doesn't break down completely, only partially. A strong acid, like hydrochloric acid, for example, breaks down completely into hydrogen ions and chlorine ions. A weak acid doesn't do that. Only a fraction of the molecules dissociate, like citric acid, for example. So even though you measure a pH and therefore a molarity of hydrogen ions, there's still a bunch of leftover, undivided acid that you've ignored. But then, you spot a bottle of one molar sodium hydroxide, a strong base. Now, a base is the opposite of an acid. Instead of a high hydrogen concentration, it has a high hydroxide concentration. And hydrogen and hydroxide are the constituents of water. So, when an abundance of hydrogen meets an abundance of hydroxides, they combine together to form water. And interestingly, if you multiply the concentrations, or molarities, of hydrogen and hydroxide, they always multiply to equal 10 to the negative 14. This is called the KW, and keep in mind this is only true when working in water-based solutions. But when you're dealing with acids and bases, you're almost always going to be dealing with water as the solvent. So you can add as much hydrogen or hydroxide as you like, but the appropriate amount will combine and break apart so that the product of their molarities is always 10 to the negative 14. This is just an intrinsic property of water, that it reaches equilibrium when the two molarities multiply to this number. And yes, it's just kind of a happy coincidence that it happens to be such a round number. I mean, it's a slight approximation, but for all intents and purposes, this is the KW. So anyways, what you can do is add sodium hydroxide, and the hydroxide will combine with the hydrogen already present from the unknown acid. But you know that only a fraction of those acid molecules have actually split apart, releasing their hydrogens. So when the hydrogen and hydroxide combine together, turning to just plain old water, another fraction of those acid molecules dissociates, keeping the equilibrium. As you add more and more sodium hydroxide, this happens again and again, until all of the acid has split apart and reacted. And at this point, it's no longer an acid. The pH should now be completely neutral if you've added the exact correct amount of sodium hydroxide to balance out the numbers of hydrogen and hydroxides in solution. But the number of moles of sodium hydroxide you added to the solution, if you've added the perfect amount, will equal the number of moles of the unknown acid you started with, because they react in a one-to-one -one ratio. One molecule of sodium hydroxide reacts with one molecule of the acid. 
You know this because your captor told you it was a monoprotic acid, or an acid with just one hydrogen per molecule. Realizing all of this, you rush for the bottle of sodium hydroxide. But now you need a good way to accurately measure when the pH hits that neutral point, when all the hydrogen ions combine with the hydroxide ions. Then you spot a bottle of phenolphthalein, a pH indicator that's clear in acidic solutions but turns pink once basic. You eagerly pour some in. And you must be on a luck streak today because you dig around and find a barrette attached to a ring stamp, a device that lets you add a very small amount of a solution at a time, a process called titration, exactly what you need. You set up the apparatus and slowly add the sodium hydroxide solution by twisting this knob on the bottom. You see the solution quickly turn pink, but then goes back to clear. It's still acidic. You slowly add more and more, careful not to add too much. And finally, you add one last drop and the solution turns pink and stays pink. The solution just crossed the neutral equivalence point and is just on the cusp of slightly basic and slightly acidic. You've added the exact amount of sodium hydroxide. You measure in the barrette that you've used 43.8 milliliters of the one molar sodium hydroxide. So you can carry out the equations and find that you use 0.0438 moles of sodium hydroxide, meaning there must have been 0.0438 moles of the acid in the original solution. And since you know that you started with 50 milliliters, you calculate that it was a 0.876 molar solution of the mystery acid you were given. But now you think, how am I going to figure out what acid it is? You think for a moment, you know you had a 0.876 molar solution and that the pH was 2.4, but how are you going to find which specific acid you were working with? But then you remember something, Ka values. The Ka value of an acid is a number that tells you how much or how little the acid breaks down. Remember, a weak acid doesn't break down completely, only partially, and the Ka value tells you how much. The higher the Ka value, the more the acid breaks down, releasing those acidic hydrogens. And each acid has its own specific Ka value. And even better, you remember the formula to find Ka. It's the molarity of the hydrogen ion squared divided by the molarity of the leftover undivided acid. Now you might also see the formula written like this, with a molarity of hydrogen multiplied by the molarity of the other part of the acid, called the conjugate base. But because when the acid breaks apart, it's a one-to-one -one ratio, the molarities of each part individually are the same. But you only know this because you know the acid is monoprotic, only has one hydrogen. So in general, this is the formula to find Ka, but this is a simpler version of the same thing when you have a monoprotic acid. So now you start by solving for this equation. To find the molarity of hydrogen ions, you just use the pH. The pH you found of 2.4 equals the negative log of the molarity of the hydrogen ions. So you calculate that the hydrogen molarity is 0.00398. Then you solve for the molarity of the undivided acid. Keep in mind, you're calculating all of this for how the acid was originally, before you reacted it with the sodium hydroxide. So to do this, you find the total molarity of the acid, 0.876, minus the molarity of the tiny bit that was naturally dissociated. And the molarity of that tiny bit that's dissociated is the molarity of the hydrogen, which you just found, 0.00398. So you subtract and find that molarity of the undivided acid. Then you plug everything into the equation and you calculate the Ka value of this mystery acid to be about 1.82 times 10 to the negative 5. By another stroke of luck, you spot a table of Ka values from many common weak acids hiding in a crack. You pick it up and search through it, and you find that acetic acid, the acid contained in vinegar, has a Ka of 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. That's within the margin of error. Your captor returns to check on you and you tell him you found that it was acetic acid. You show him every step of your work. You show him the equation for Ka and how you found each variable, how you measured the pH to find the molarity of hydrogen, how you used a barrette to titrate the acid with sodium hydroxide to find the molarity of the acid, then how you subtracted the molarity of the hydrogen from the molarity of the acid to obtain the molarity of the undivided acid. You show him how you plug these numbers into the formula, finding that the Ka was 1.82 times 10 to the negative 5. And lastly, you show him how your Ka value and the table's value for acetic acid are the closest match. Your captor looks over your work, then lowers his mask and nods 
you were free to go. And you return back to the world stronger. Smarter. More empathetic. More polite. And more charismatic. I will release you only when you can tell me what monoprotic weak acid I poured in here. Uh, vinegar? Okay, you're good to go.